Hello, I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I started my career with an internal medicine residency and followed that with three years of work as an emergency physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In the course of my over 20 years in radiology, I have worked as a private practice radiologist, an academic radiologist, and for the last 17 years as a teleradiologist for VRAD. I have been the chief medical officer there for eight years and am licensed to practice in all 50 states. Radiology trauma. So this one, I broke into two groups of 12. We're going to have 12 intracranial hemorrhage cases and then 12 of face and spine trauma. So a globe rupture. Well, you know, you got to have one of these. Uh, people in academic circles, they don't talk about whether you have a foreign body to the orbit, but how good is it and what is it? Uh, the most important thing I want to point out to people about the globe, and this is an extreme example, but it should be perfectly round perfectly round. The smallest defect in its contour in a trauma, you should be considering calling a globe rupture. I've been amazed at the kinds of calls I've seen many radiologists that are better than I make with regard to globe rupture. So uh, if you see anything out of round, as uh, old Dr. Pitt used to call it, anything that is not perfectly round, you should be considering calling it. And that's especially true with the globe and the femoral head. So here you can see it's obviously distorted. There's increased density inside consistent with hemorrhage and there's quite a bit of retrobulbar stranding and gas as well. Higher up you can see the culprit. Obviously you'll shoot your eye out. We all know how dangerous these things are even without the movie. But a nice example of that globe distortion, right? the buckling there at the back aspect of it clearly denoting a rupture. The lens uh, really took it directly, it looks like. There's really no lens tissue remaining. All right, that's a globe rupture. This is quite a case. There is actually linear density within the globe. You can see it on both sides, actually. In addition, look at the posterior displacement of the lens. Look at it compared to the opposite side. So that is a lens subluxation. This was minor trauma that led to this, but that is typically the case. Uh, retinal or choroidal detachment usually happens in a myopic patient, uh, but it can follow just minor trauma. So this, even though it was minor trauma, uh, managed to sublux the lens and detach the retina or choroid. So let's talk about choroidal versus retinal detachment. Uh, they're two distinct layers and they can actually be discerned one from another on CT. So I showed this case, gosh, the last time I showed neurotrauma stuff, which must be four or five years ago, and someone wrote me and corrected me because I was calling this a retinal detachment, which in fact it's not. It's a choroidal detachment because as we go through here, you will see the leaves of the detachment diverge as it approaches the optic disc. Watch right here. See how they diverge towards the optic disc. A retinal detachment will converge towards the optic disc. So this one is actually a choroidal detachment. And I went back to the operative records and checked that, and that was in fact the case. You see right there, it was diverging. So if they are wider, at the back of the eyeball, uh, that typically is going to mean that's a choroidal detachment. Here it is on the coronal, really nice view. You can see it's separated from the inside of the globe all throughout. All right, so that is a choroidal detachment. This is an incredible case. This is actually a ruptured, avulsed optic nerve. There you can see it is no longer uh, syncing up with the back of the eyeball as it should. There's also significant retrobulbar stranding 
and there's a little medial orbital wall fracture as well. So pretty impressive case here. There it is. You can see the optic nerve just doesn't attach to the back of the globe any longer. This one was an embarrassment. I'm glad to say I did not see this. A radiologist uh, who I won't name uh, saw this one, called it retrobulbar stranding, called the fracture, but did not call the optic nerve. And when I went to look at it later, I picked it up and looked at the clinical history and it said loss of vision left eye. So there's no excuse for someone missing that one. Uh, it's an unusual injury, certainly, but uh, even the clinical history was on your side here. So optic nerve avulsion. All right, and this is quite a case. You can see right here, there is contrast opacification, the left aspect of the cavernous sinus, uh, which should not be there, obviously. And then the classic finding, our superior ophthalmic vein is markedly enlarged and is showing retrograde contrast opacification. Of course, those uh, veins are valveless, and that's why it will manifest this way with chemosis and exophthalmus. So there is that dilated and enhancing superior ophthalmic vein and the enhancing cavernous sinus. Pretty impressive. So that is a carotid cavernous sinus fistula. All right, for completeness sake, we had to have a blowout. This one's nice in that you actually can see it on the axials. Uh, kind of neat. Again, I don't think there's any excuse for, especially on facial imaging, for not looking at every plane. Uh, but it is kind of cool when we, we can see these. You know, in my day, again, uh, we, we were limited to just axial on even facial scans in the early days of CT. So you don't know how good you've got it. So look at this, there's the trap door, the inferior, the orbital floor there, and you can see the herniation of both fat and inferior rectus right there. Here it is on bone window, again, the trap door and the herniated orbital fat. So there it is on the axial, you can actually see the defect in the orbital floor and the displaced inferior rectus. And here you see that bony trapdoor right there on the medial aspect of the maxillary sinus. Let's look at them on the coronals. And you see that inferior rectus herniated, and then more posteriorly, you'll see it actually pinned on that shelf of bone. Oof. This patient does have a little gaze malalignment, little uh, gaze deviation. Uh, you'd expect it to be quite a bit worse. And these people are usually pretty miserable from the diplopia. But you can appreciate from the location of the lenses, I think best on the coronals, that there is a divergent gaze. All right, we'll look at that one more time. And there are the coronal bone windows. Again, that little trap door lying in the medial aspect of the maxillary sinus. All right, a blowout fracture with rectus herniation and pinning. This is pretty straightforward, just to encourage you to look at all planes and on all windows. This is a tracheal laceration. You can see there's gas all throughout the neck, but it's pretty hard to appreciate the tracheal wall defect here on the axials. When you go to the coronals, there it is, lying in the axial plane, but clear disruption of the trachea. This was done with a steak knife. So here's the axial showing that small laceration, incised wound, in fact. Beautifully shown on the coronal right there, the source of obviously all that soft tissue gas. So 
So that's a tracheal laceration. This one is an esophageal laceration. Fortunately, they gave this patient oral contrast. And when I called up and said, why did you think to give him oral contrast? He said, every time he swallowed the blood that was in his mouth, it was jetting out uh, in, into his supraclavicular region. So it wasn't a, a huge diagnostic leap. They did give him oral contrast. You can see there's gas all throughout the soft tissues, and that contrast is clearly spilling out. And here, of course, is the bullet that caused that issue. On a 3D, the contrast actually shows up. So you can see the contrast collection there in the supraclavicular region. I thought that was kind of neat and worth sharing. And there again is the bullet posteriorly. So you can see the tract of the bullet and the contrast and the gas throughout the soft tissues. And the bullet posteriorly. And again, you can appreciate that contrast collection uh, pretty clearly denotes the region where the spillage is occurring. 